be among you. <laughs> Sally Cohn is a progressive political pundit for CNN. And she tells the story of talking to a gospel singer at a meeting of Republican women in southwest Louisiana. This is, these are Sally's words. She said, oh, I love Rush Limbaugh. And I first thought, oh, my goodness. And then I thought, wonderful. Here's a chance for me to get larger here. So I said to her, could we meet sometime this week for some sweet teas, and you could explain to me why you love Rush Limbaugh. And she said, yeah, sure. The next day, we are meeting for sweet teas, and she explains, I love Rush Limbaugh because he hates feminazis. And I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I asked her, well, what is a feminazi? Well, she says, it's a feminist who doesn't like children and wants men to cook. She goes on to environmental wackos, those people who want to, she says, regulate us to death. Now, Kuhn shared this story as part of a dialogue she had with conservative pundit Eric Erickson, a radio talk show host and a fundamentalist minister. Sponsored by the University of Montana, this event was sold out and was a dialogue about how we can possibly mend the rift that we have seen in our nation. My friends, this Sunday is many things. It is the Sunday that is the closest to Veterans Day, and we must honor those who gave of their lives so that we might have democracy. And it is the Sunday closest to Francis David's birthday, which is a day that is celebrated by our religious kin in Transylvania, and we must remember that people died so that we may have religious freedom. And this Sunday is the first after our national election. And what we know, what we know, and some of us are celebrating that and some of us are very disappointed today that we didn't get a clearer mandate against hate and we are frightened in our hearts. Wherever we are, what we all know is that there is a giant rift out there in our nation. And that after record turnout, we still remain a nation divided. Perhaps a little more representatively so, but still a nation divided. And not just divided, torn asunder. For what we know last week, we know today as well, that a festering wound of hatred is keeping us from dialogue with one another. And that our decisions that we have made to pay less attention to our democracy, to underinvest in education, to overindulge perhaps in personal consumerism, has promoted a dangerous lack of togetherness. And within this has blossomed deep division and also deep personal loneliness that makes people vulnerable to extremities of thought. How would it be if we reclaimed what it means to be religious people. This is the first day of the rest of our life. We could make the commitment today, my friends, to truly not be afraid to say that we are religious people, people of faith. The word religion comes from the same word as the word ligament, a word I'd prefer not to think about a whole lot today. <laughs> But it is true. The word religion comes from the same word as the word ligament, and it means to bind together. It is our job in these times to do many things, and one of them is to be the people that bind together. For the extent of our division is clear. It, how can we be both prophetic and compassion? How can we be truth-telling, all-embracing, and loving in that embrace? The extent of this division is clear. That, in the wake of 25 deaths on this Veterans Day weekend, the president of our nation could send a tweet. And this brought tears to my eyes in the first service. It's doing it again. But could send a tweet attacking our state. When people among us are mourning and people, others are worried about friends and family that they don't know where they are. 
that shows how much we have been able to look at one another, not as fellow human beings, but to polarize ourselves to the point where we no longer understand our common humanity. And my friends, that is our job. To be the place that can hold the vision of what we need to be, but also remember our common humanity first. Today we sit among this smoky air, sobered by so many things. And if you didn't find anything else on that list of pledges you wanted to sign, then perhaps you can just commit to politely calling the White House and telling that per the, our leader why it is, not it is not a good thing to use your power in that way. That's another pledge we could make. Because as we mark this weekend when religious freedom in our tradition is celebrated, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to use that freedom in this day the first day of the rest of our lives, this world that is here after the elections of 2018. And this is one thing we know. Hate will not make any of this better. Hate is what those who would destroy our democracy count on being able to generate. And as religious people, we must stop the chain of hatred with us. Climate change may eventually destroy our world. The concentration of wealth among us may mangle our economy. And yet what is clear is that the continued perpetuation of hatred as a way of doing business will destroy our democracy first. Think about the many, many lives it has claimed in the years that have just passed. Loneliness is becoming toxic. People are isolating themselves because they are afraid to engage with the world. Suicide in some states is now claiming almost twice as many lives as homicide. And there are many reasons for this. One is a sense of hopelessness because of a lack of meaning, a lack of connection, and a lack of economic opportunity, which we all need to be part of addressing. None of this, though, my friends, is made better by perpetuating hate. Do not get me wrong. I did not have that strong of a blow to the head this week. I am not saying that we should not continue to oppose threats to our Constitution, threats to those most vulnerable. Thank you, Reverend Neal, for that list of the people we must hold in our hearts, especially now. We must stand up against those who would take away the rights long fought for, and we must continue to make this a place of deep sanctuary and a model for what it means to live together even when we don't know how to do that in an increasingly diverse world, honoring all of whom all of us are. We have a lot to do, and I personally do not believe that I have room to indulge in hate because I need my energy for other things. Eric Erickson, the conservative pundit in the Montana Forum, warned us of the dangers of judging others. Don't just impute motives to someone that you don't really know their motives, he says. Some people believe that things are mutually contradictory. I think we all do. I know I do. There may, people may have real reasons for thinking the way they do, and we cannot know until we talk to one another. But just getting out of imputing motives would go a long way of helping things. So let's take a moment back to Sally Coon's conversation over sweet teas with the Republican gospel singer. She says this. After I'm asking her, she stops me and says, you've told me that you come from the other side. Is it hard for you to listen to me? And I told her, actually, it's not hard at all. I have my alarm system off. And I'm learning about you, and you're doing me such a big favor to share your thoughts. I can't tell you how grateful I am. And then she says, oh, take your alarm system off? I do that too. I do it with my kids. I do it with the people in my church. So I thought, says Sally, okay, let's start with that. A little common ground. No matter how we look at it, my friends, we know that the polarization is not helping us. We must speak out against a rise of authoritarianism, a rise of dangerous nationalism, any, any effort to demonize the other. But when we also demonize, we make matters worse. We have to set boundaries. We have to say some things are not acceptable. We do not have to villainize or demonize. 
what would it be like for the rest of 2018, 2019, 2020 to spend a little more time talking with our neighbors? You know, the neighbors, the ones with the Trump 2018 sign in their front lawn. What would it be like to spend more time talking to our relatives about why we see the nation differently than they do? Or what would it mean to volunteer or spend time here, not just getting to know the people who are like you, but maybe doing a few things you don't normally do here so that you can get to know some people that are different from you? I want to be really clear that I'm not saying that increased civility is the end goal, because we know that politeness at all costs has been one of the things that has allowed us to keep inequities in place. But I do believe that we can hold the complexity that says that not fomenting hate ourselves can be a big step towards having the time and energy to stay focused and engaged for friends. <laughs> this Sunday after the election, we need to stay engaged, engaged with our nation and engaged in making this place as much as a brave and safe space as possible, and engaged with the fear and anger that lives in our own hearts, being willing to be vulnerable. What would it be like if those white men who are worried about their livelihood across our nation were able to be vulnerable instead of needing to be angry? To me, Sally Kuhn says, the opposite of hate isn't love, it's connection. You don't have to love people not to hate them. You have to see that you have something at your core, a fundamental humanity, a fundamental goodness that transcends the division. After 2016, I know many of you talked to me about this. Many of us didn't know how to go home for Thanksgiving, didn't know how to talk to their coworkers who they know voted differently than they did. Perhaps now it is time to reach out and have those conversations to be willing to engage across difference, because this is what we know today in 2018, that to truly move beyond a politics of hate, we must forge new connections, we must address the deep rift within our economy and within our nation. I am sporting today this beautiful cane. Usually, it is a decorative object in my house. It is beloved because it was made for me by a mentor the Reverend David McPherson, who, when he came home after his long days as a minister, did woodworking. He makes these and he puts quotes on them from famous uni universalists. And here's the one that's on mine. It's from P.T. Barnum, who, who was a 19th century universalist and a great philanth uh, philanthropic presence in our tradition. He said this in the language of his time. The world is going forward to universal brotherhood or back to universal barbarism. What would it mean, my friends, to think more of this holiday season about how we spend our money and who might be benefiting? What would it mean to invite some people over for conversation? Maybe not over sweet teas, if that is not your beverage of choice, but maybe over coffee and reach out for a conversation. What would it mean to put our alarm systems down and to talk to someone about what's making us scared? What would it be like to talk for, with me, for men to talk with men about what it's like to be a man in this world and how confusing it is? What would it be like for female-identified people to have that same conversation? For everyone to be willing to talk to others about what they are afraid of and what they hope for. We wake up on this Sunday morning after the election, and we see the red sky. And some of us remember that old adage, red sky at morning, sailors take warning. The danger is not past, my friends. The danger is still here, and the danger is that we will become complacent and not engage and not do what we must do. For now we know how bad our inaction can be and what it can perpetuate. Here we can become people of religious conviction, people who bind together. Here we can use the religious freedom we have been granted to perpetuate love. It starts with us, and it starts here today. 
The world is not perfect, but we are better together. The world is, we hope, going forward into universal salvation through the spirit of unity that is our tradition. We are the hope. We are the courage. Together, my friends, we are more. We invite you to rise and body your spirit. Let's sing our closing song.